Thank you, Brody and Jane. Okay, for at least three years, I've heard so much about some amazing work being done by a bunch of renegade engineers at Liberty Mutual, a large American mutually held insurance company. By all accounts, these engineers who are based in Ireland were among the first in the organization to get real applications running in the cloud using technologies very different than one typically found in a risk-averse enterprise those days. But they eventually would help elevate the productivity of over 6,000 technologists at the firm. Not only did they help modernize the technical practices across the organization, starting with their e-commerce site, they also helped create the AWS Cloud Development Kit serverless patterns, which was widely adopted not just within the company, but across the industry, even being heavily promoted by AWS themselves. <laughs> it was made popular because it made writing serverless applications so easy and understandable for developers. So last year, I finally got to meet some of the people behind this effort, who were leading a team of over 500 engineers in Belfast, Ireland. I was so excited to finally meet him, especially since he was introduced to me by none other than Adrian Cockcroft, who wrote this amazing, gushing introduction letter. And I am so delighted that they will be codifying their learnings into a book that will be published next year called The Flywheel Effect. So here is David and Michael. Thanks, Gene. Uh, so, my name is Dave Anderson. I'm a technical fellow for Bizarre Voice. The story I want to tell you is really about space for innovation, how we made that journey from the last few years till today. I'd like to introduce my colleague here. Hey everyone, I'm Michael O'Reilly, an architect with Globalization Partners. So, uh, myself, Michael, and our third amigo, Mark McCann, working together probably for about 13, 14 years ago. And um, back in Liberty Mutual at the time, we were working a lot of kind of e-commerce sites, big systems, but on-prem. And we, we were really lucky to be in a position in Liberty Mutual where the move to the cloud was starting. And this was back maybe in 2013. I just took a CTO role in Belfast and had a small team of architects. And uh, we started to look at the landscape and we could see there was opportunity for a huge change in a Fortune 100 company. This is an opportunity you don't get every day. So we wordly mapped out what we think might happen and it was clear that there was a different cloud application architecture approach that we could take. Huge risk. It turned out to be serverless. We didn't know that's what it was. We didn't really know if this was actually made sense. Massive personal risk. With any big risk like this, a lot of middle management pushed back, say, why are you doing this? We had the conviction to press on. It was almost like a poker game where you can see there's one hand that's going to pay off big, but you have to play it. So we started to bring in some of these practices like a serverless, well-architected, engineering, secure by design, all these things that were to become very you know, good practice, but at the time we didn't really know. This diagram was something we drew out at the time to try and make sense of this kind of, this thing we were trying to do, this, this sort of almost like a system we were trying to create within a huge organization to basically reimagine engineering for the whole enterprise. A massive ask for like a, what I would call a, a small office sitting in Belfast. About 2019, 2020, we had achieved a huge amount of um, uh, success with this service first strategy. We actually started to coin it a service first enterprise. The network effects that we were starting to see were starting to come true. And we, all the weak signals that we had seen back in 2013 were starting to kick in. And like anything, the numbers didn't lie. We were starting to see massive returns on some of the risks that we had that we played off maybe back in 2014, 15, 16. And we, I, I put this diagram together to try and explain what we had actually achieved because it was so difficult, you know, because uh, cloud application architecture is, is so hard to describe. And once I drew this diagram, I actually called um, Adrian Cockcroft from AWS. I showed him this diagram and said, you know, do you think this, that, this, this approach makes sense? Because I haven't seen it anywhere else. And he said, no, this is absolutely brilliant. You're, you're leading the way with the way you're thinking here. And to say that least I was shocked. So we described it in four layers. Foundational was are basically our key engineering approaches, which are kind of bread and butter stuff. Then we wanted to layer in our, our cloud kind of expertise, security, uh, infrastructure as code, and certification. Then have an opinion, be opinionated about architecture, serverless first, to be well architected, focus on cost, have an organization strategy, have a clear North Shore business metric, and then organization team topologies be organized for success. And then find the acceleration. How do we scale that across 6,000 engineers? We CDK architecture patterns, 
specific innovation practices, evolutionary strategy, encourage teams to pave their own way, code is a liability, try and get engineers to write less code, and then evolution architecture, try and get the concept into the business that we are always changing these systems, which is quite difficult. There's lots of really good stories out there about Liberty Mutual. I would actually Google Liberty Mutual Serverless. There's a whole bunch of case studies. Uh, Michael, you were there those years. I mean, what's the, what stands out for you in this picture? Yeah, no, thanks, Dave. I mean, I, I love this. I love this. Um, I love this diagram. It brings back some awesome kind of memories. Um, but certainly, I, like for me, I was kind of go back to the, the foundational because I think that was that really, you know, set us up for a lot of the success that we went on to achieve. Um, you know, working with the teams, helping the teams really become data driven, you know, and by that, like understand what measures were important to them, both from a business perspective, also from a technical perspective, how were they able to add value? So when you kind of enable your teams to understand their, their mission and their purpose through the data, it then makes a lot of these other things easier to kind of integrate and, 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 and drive within, within the organization. You know, for example, I know we're going to look at uh, serverless first org strategy. So this is a building block that was within the, the diagram. And really, we, we coined this because obviously we were operating at scale. You know, we're a large organization. We've got dozens and dozens of squads, product squads, different types of squads. But we tried to distill that down into something that would fit into, into teams' heads. Um, but really summing it up, you know, this is kind of the, the metrics that we use to help create teams that maybe didn't understand their purpose or their mission and maybe working on non-differentiating type work or work they didn't understand to become teams that really understood their mission and purpose, had good situational awareness, and were able to kind of make good decisions in terms of the products and features that they were able to then go and build and develop, leveraging that serverless first uh, organizational strategy. Yeah, and Robert, serverless first, that was important because you have engineers at an insurance company. Their focus should be insurance. You know, that it's it's the business. So we I'm so proud of some of the outcomes that we kind of drove. One of the ones that I thought was was amazing was a call transaction cost. We ended up building a complete sort of um, cloud call center using service technology, using kind of uh, on AWS like Connect and uh, Lambda and a bunch of other kind of services. And we reduced the cost of a call from $20 down to four cent. And by about a year and a half ago, I think they were taking something like a quarter of a million calls per month on that. It was a purely serverless kind of automated um, call center. Um, yeah, and for me, you know, um, I know we've got a call out here. It's the second point, but the rapid delivery. There was a there was a scenario I remember just at the when the pandemic kicked in, and effectively we had a business use case in South America where our where our agents had to go and visit the homes of potential customers. You know, if they were trying to insure their car, they needed a manual inspection. Now, obviously, with the pandemic, that became much more difficult, and um, obviously there was issues with that. But leveraging our serverless first org strategy, we were able to kind of assemble an application that was leveraging artificial intelligence to, to kind of automate that process and build a product that you know could protect both our agents and our customers and and, and move that, that that process digital. Um, also, that became that was an innovation in a sense, and we were able to then roll that out to subsequent countries over the, the, the next three to four months. And I think that's we rolled that from South America six countries wide, and then we moved that into Europe. So hugely successful story with that one. Um, and then and like the digitization of the business is, is, is really what you're talking about here. And um, one of my favorite stories that I'm also super proud of is the fact that we had, we had won, and insurance has thousands of applications for a big company. We had one small application that was sitting on WebSphere. I think it was costing maybe $50,000 a year to run. Um, one of the teams seen that as an opportunity, refactored it to serve a solution and reduced the cost from $50,000 a year down to $20 a year. I mean, and think of the sense of empowerment that those engineers have by a, a nice kind of project like that. Absolutely phenomenal. phenomenal. And I think even on the smaller scale, we, you know, it was really successful. But even, again, on the larger scale, you know, like we, we applied this strategy to some of our largest insurance platforms. You know, I remember our global insurance platform that we were rolling out into Europe, and it was kind of driven a large part by our serverless first org strategy. It was able to kind of, you know, help the org move its scale as well, drive scale into the business, which was fantastic, um, really, really successful. And then there's also a whole big story about the, the journey the engineers went on to kind of 
you know, work through this kind of system that we created and, and really kind of excel. Uh, at one point, I think I had four AWS heroes on, on, on my sort of extended team. I mean, very few companies even have four heroes. Uh, we'd like Gillian McCann, Gillian Armstrong, Matt Coulter, and Tom McLaughlin. And then there's a whole bunch of people as community builders as well. So these are engineers that have done fantastic pieces of work, you know, doing keynotes, big presentations for AWS. Uh, Gillian McCann took uh, WorkGrid as, as a project and spun that out into a, a complete startup, its own separate company. I mean, massive success stories here with people focusing on the business outcome and using serverless to go fast at high, at quality and at scale. It's so proud of the work we did there. And what we almost seen then was like AWS started to take notice of the success we were having. And uh, back in 2020, there was a serverless first function uh, event where, um, and I didn't, I didn't know this, Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, actually described Liberty Mutual as organizational nirvana because of our serverless first cloud application architecture approach. I almost fell off my chair watching this at home. Um, and then six months ago at reInvent, Matt Coulter, um, one of the architects, he um, did the keynote with Werner Vogels to tell the Liberty Mutual story, which was an unbelievable uh, presentation. I was so proud watching Matt. I was, I was in the front row cheering him along. And he, he told this brilliant story about but the whole evolution for, for Liberty Mutual becoming like a service for standard price. And um, one of the things that we did was we codified a lot of our patterns and created this um, CDK pattern um, kind of library to help developers uh, create their kind of applications really fast. And now that's been open sourced and that's its own kind of um, open source project itself. And Matt has been fantastic in kind of and leading that community with CDK Day and a whole bunch of other stuff. So not only have we created building blocks to build applications that they had been shared out, and I think there's something like 5,000 people on that GitHub repository. It's absolutely, absolutely it's huge. Phenomenal story. Yeah. yeah. So that creates a flywheel effect where engineers start to see the success and start to learn more and, and see the, 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 the feedback of, in their community, getting, getting really good, good um, uh, kudos with other engineers. So then we kind of stop back and says, we, we, we've stumbled across something here that's a fantastic technique. Let's try and distill all this thinking into a book, which we're publishing with IT Revolution uh, this November, called The Flywheel Effect, with myself, uh, Mike, and Mark uh, putting this book together. And really, it's about how do you take your business strategy with worldly mapping and your kind of technology strategy with modern cloud and combine them together? And what does that flywheel effect look like? So we talk about this in the book and get into the thinking and some of the theory about how we, and the practice and the success stories of how we actually made this happen and how to do this yourself. So really one of the questions that I, I found was fascinating as I, as I think about other companies is what happens after the transformation? You know, we've had the hullabaloo around where we're going to the cloud, digital transformation. What happens when all the consultants have been paid? We've did our three or four years. The big bonus pot's been emptied. Everyone's gone out and bought their cars and boats, et cetera. Everyone's got cloud socks. They've gone back from the conference. We're all high-fiving each other. Mm -hmm. At some point, the board or the CEO goes, okay, we spent a whole bunch of money going to the cloud. Why are we not delivering faster? It's a great question. And I mean, and, and really the question is, is technology really driving your business? Because there is a culture change required. I mean, in this event, we've we talked about the DevOps culture for, for, for many years, and that is the, that is that cultural change that needs to happen. Just lift and shift into the cloud just gives you a nicer data center. You're not really benefiting from the cloud. And one of the ways we sort of started to describe this is this idea of modern cloud versus legacy cloud. If you just lift and shift what you have, you've got legacy cloud. You, you maybe still have a monolith in the cloud. You maybe still have a lot of EC2s, virtual images. Maybe you're logging in, changing stuff don't have that automation. With modern cloud, you're thinking and behaving differently. If you're very, you have a very small time to value, you can prove value quickly. You can use the latest techniques and you've got that empowerment and really strong developer experience. We think this, this way of acting differently is, is, the, is, is the actual massive success factor for modern cloud. Yep, Dave. And you know, when we talk about the the flywheel and the flywheel, as we've described it here, is you know how do we how do we create a flywheel? How do we create that movement and progression uh, within our organization? And this is the flywheel that we talk about within the book. So we start off with really trying to understand our purpose. Um, we set ourselves. We we create an environment that supports challenge and psychological safety around challenge um, in terms of really getting to understand that purpose. Um, 
then we kind of leverage you know situational awareness to decide on next best action you know what's the next best action for us to take and then also you know regardless of what the next best action is we've always we've all, always got to keep an eye on the long-term value and they have taken this back into wordly mapping wordly mapping helps us always have those conversations it helps with the challenge it helps with that situational awareness it helps us always keep an eye on what what's our purpose but it also you know can help us drive and and, and make sure that we're working towards that that long-term value so we're going to get into that i think in our, our wordly mapping session yeah, so some of you may not be aware of wordly mapping but so we're going to take you through how we as, as an architecture team have used this technique to actually visualize some of the things we're trying to do in this value flywheel to kind of drive that change we, we had talked about earlier so let's so anytime you're starting a wordly map the best way to start this is with a value chain so we've picked over the persona here as the anchor as a senior leader this is likely a, a ceo or maybe someone on the board a, a very senior leader in your organization and for me, there's there's two main value streams that that senior leader is looking at when they think about technology. First, is time to value, right? It's not lead time, time to value. Um, so, which depends on good architecture. I would say, well, architect is, and what good architecture depends on technical leadership. These are just straight dependencies within your organization. And then the second kind of um, say customer need for that senior leader is innovation. So, for me, innovation depends on modern cloud. And modern cloud depends on a strong team environment. So it's it's how is your engineering environment set up? Like if anything, anything you want to kind of add about these value chains? Well, the thing is, is I mean, what I would ask the question is, how do we know they're right? And the answer is, well, we don't. But it helps us get out of that analysis paralysis and helps us really get into that that conversation. But then I think applying mapping and the approach to mapping helps us get a wee bit more, apply a wee bit more meaning and a wee bit more understanding to that that conversation i mean if i was doing a wordly map i would do these pretty quickly i would just have something fairly simple and just lay them out it's like a five ten minute exercise so here we've got the shape of the map here as you can see we've kind of got business growth on top left there we'll architect it on the right and the environment for success is that kind of key enabler so let's go back to the start and actually draw this map out again and i think what's important here is as an architecture team, you need to know what you invest in and what we don't invest in. What do we need to improve as an architecture team and what else do we not touch? So something like operational excellence, we know how to do operational excellence. As a senior leader, there is a specific need there. It's understood. Job done. Mike, what do you think about this one? Yeah, 100% agree. And if it's if we're following practices and standards around operational excellence that aren't commodities, what are they and why are we doing them? You know, So that's yeah. a good conversation. Pretty simple. The other two, time to value, is probably more, we understand it well, and we understand there's key things like observability and customer customer obsession that, that are important there. For business growth, it's a bit more kind of, uh, you know, a hypothesis. Uh, we, we're still trying to understand better about how do you actually get that business growth. Yeah, it should always be custom. It should always be custom. And then I love here out in the left, you know, you've got sustainability and coming in in the genesis space. How is that going to affect what we do? You know, uh, sustainability is impacting industry in a big way. Cloud providers are allowing us to uh, measure our carbon footprint. It is going to have an impact. What What is that impact? Let's have a conversation. Um, what could that be? Again, as architects, we want to figure out that we're, we're being most effective. And for me, I thought when definitely went through this, it's around that developer enablement, developer experience. How can we have a modern kind of um, tech stack that we can experiment and learn, which includes the, and the, the foundational block here is modern cloud. Absolutely. Um, so you can see in here that uh, developer enablement is a huge component of uh, our ability to modernize, and it does feed back up into into time to value. So really, what are we doing as a as a technical leadership squad to really enable our teams and, and focus on developer experience and developer enablement? So that's a huge factor in our map. And you think of the major cloud providers. This is where they're focused on right now, and there's good reason for that. Other things like well architected, both Amazon. Uh, Google and Azure have really, really solid well architected frameworks that are maybe eight, nine, ten years old. We know what good architecture looks like. You just follow the guidelines. Don't there's, there's no custom good architecture practices. They're very well understood, and then we can codify those in cloud architecture patterns. Absolutely, and well architected gives us that that commoditized set of architectural standards that allows us to create patterns consistently across the whole organization. So when we do enable our engineers by putting them into that that cloud self-service portal, 
they're all really consistent. They're all working to the same set of enabling constraints. So as an architect, I love that stuff. Yeah, and like adopt the standard. Don't write your own. Like you are not different. <laughs> and then finally, growth mindset. If you go down this route, you need to have technical leaders who are willing to change and experiment, and engineers who are willing to try new things. So that growth mindset is so important for us. Wardly mapping is that hypothesis that we could maybe map things out and understand what we need to do, what we need not, what we don't need to do. And then psychological safety. That idea of it's our role to try and create that for the teams. Give the teams space to learn. Completely agree. And, you know, in a in a diverse sort of cultural environment, such as a, a big corporation, extremely important. How do you get everyone's ideas? How do you get them involved in that modernization process? Um, how do you create a, a space where people want to come and be creative? Super important part of the map. So you see how complicated this this whole picture is like. But, by, but w- what we have found is drawing this out like a map enables that conversation and challenge to try and get everyone on the same page. But let's shrink this back down and really see the, the shape of it again. Again, you want to tie the senior leader needs right down to what the architecture team can do, to what we need to do within the engineering teams. That's the kind of chain here that we're trying to um, reflect here. And then from a modern cloud, this is probably the unknown piece that we need to move to the right to modernize. Absolutely, Dave. And you know, we talked about CDK patterns as being really a massive part of that serverless first org strategy. You know, so we were investing quite heavily in embracing modern cloud. How do we get modern cloud into all, every part of the the organization? Well, our strategy is evolving around developer enablement, that cloud self service, those patterns that are built on well architected. We planned to shift that from a custom, you know, being built as a as a, as a custom component and one part of the org, but make it the the de facto that's their, our modern cloud strategy for the whole organization so that again important part of movement and we also talked about sustainability as being a climatic pattern that is beginning to penetrate the map there in terms of the the business growth area so you can see you're already starting to see movement within the within the map and having to deal with that movement mm. and then that takes us as we talk about the book the flywheel effect we start to see the value flywheel um reflected here in the map and number one was the, the customer need there for clarity of purpose is that first part of the flywheel. Um, number four, as architecture, as architects, we've got well architected, is that's our kind of long term value. But the, the 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 difficult things to do are number two and three as two parts of the flywheel. How do we create a challenge an environment for success where we can challenge thinking? And how do we introduce like a next best action kind of mindset that we can act quickly and we kind of go with that modern cloud, which will get you to that kind of well architected long term value. Absolutely. And this was you know, the flywheel effect in action for us. We've kind of talked about it briefly already, but, you know, even we look at that challenge in landscape area, you know, t- type of things that we were doing was looking at replication and, you know, across all our squads and our, our environments and our teams. What could we do to address that? How could we reduce our costs? What is our next best action? How could we, you know, um, uh, take actions and apply strategies to move that 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 modern cloud practice from from custom build into that product for for our organization so again the the, the flywheel in fact is very very real in, in this this scenario and remember the map drives conversation so really the four the four phases there again we've got them here in, in the value flywheel in the book with a clarity purpose which is that north star in the time the value challenge that environment Next best action, your developer experience and serverless first, your modern cloud strategy, and then long-term value, which is your problem prevention culture, well architect, sustainability. This is concept of joining your business strategy with your technology strategy. And again, this is what we're talking about uh, in the book. And we explore this to, to, with, with, with great detail and examples in the book. So thanks very much for listening. Um, here's the help we're looking for, as, as Jean has asked us to kind of give our call out. Um, the, the book is there for um, pre-order on Amazon, and you can see there it's it, it's be out in, in November. What I'm really interested in, and I'm very happy to continue the discussion on Slack or on Twitter, are you seeing this modern versus legacy cloud split? I see a lot of both modern legacy cloud, but I haven't seen it really be named in this way yet. Do you see this flywheel in organization? I've seen this in lots of organizations, but I'm looking for more examples that we can, you know, really kind of um, understand this and help people through this. Have you looked at well architect and sustainability? For me, the well architect frameworks are absolute gold, but I don't see the adoption that I think there should be there. Uh, have you tried wordly mapping and sense making and technical discovery within your architecture teams and technical leadership teams? A lot of people are afraid of wordly mapping, but a lot of people have got massive success. How can we lower the bar to entry and help help leaders actually map out their landscape and, and, and drive forward? Um, 
I don't know about you, Mike, but I mean, it'd be great to kind of hear people's opinions and, and continue the discussion. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Brilliant. So that's us. Um, so we have more, uh, like I said, the book's coming out on uh, November in IT Revolution, and it's been a great experience writing the book. Uh, we also have a blog there at the serverlessedge.com, and we have um, um, our Serverless Crack channel and podcast. I look us up on Twitter there, and um, please reach out to us on Slack on the DevOps Enterprise uh, channel. I'm happy to keep the conversation going. So and thank you, Eugene, for the kind introduction. Thank you. Thanks.